Um, so, just a few remarks. We've changed the structure. This is just a room-wide debate a little bit. We don't have to go on for too long. Um, but again, just since I guess I don't know if Krasny's in the room, but thank you very much. There you are. Thank you very much for supporting this, actually. And it's interesting because we should have done this ourselves a long time ago. And it's actually wonderful for you to give us the pretext, actually, um, to bring together the community and review uh, where we stand. And I want to make just a few remarks. We recently um, started a press, the SFI Press, and it's doing incredibly well, actually. Um, but one of the books that we republished uh, was the original founding volume that David had edited, David Pines. But we also included all the transcripts of the debates they had that David did not, <laughs> which is rather telling. Um, and what's incredible, on the one hand, is how many of the areas they identified have proven to be very fruitful. I mean, they were talking about... And areas that we haven't really investigated. I mean, we've been very weak in psychology, I think. Um, and they, no one predicted what would happen with machine learning. It wasn't even evident uh, in that first volume. But all of the contributions were dominated by toy models. And I think about 10 years into the evolution of SFI, there was a phase transition. And there's no one who works there now who doesn't, isn't deeply embedded in empirical systems. And that wasn't true then. And a huge amount of conversation about cellular automata and simple toy models, very enamored of early 8-bit computers. And uh, it was all very interesting and very generative, but it, it just isn't like this. And now, 30 years in, just listening to what people have to say, it's just kind of mind-blowing. Um, I mean, many of us have had, you know, my very fairly brief career, but just people not believing that there were genuine, uh, regular principles of complex systems, meaning adaptive systems, just to demystify this. And it's just so overwhelmingly obvious from what we've heard over the last two days that they're everywhere, that there are these mesoscopic and macroscopic regularities that are terrestrially universal, um, and there's just no disputing it. And the, the question is why this isn't more widely investigated. It, it's just amazing to me. And so I, that's been a, uh, just a bit of a revelation. I think I always knew it, but I'm deeply appreciative, actually, for this community uh, for making that so clear with really great work. What isn't clear, and let's make a few points and I'll shut up, um, is where these come from. Um, the, the widespread regularities, we have beautiful... Um, often mechanical models or simple stochastic processes that can generate the statistics. But there are these open questions. Um, Bob started with the Darcy Thompson and Jeffrey sort of kind of nearly ended with him, which was this notion of all we do is we just amplify on pre-existing physical constraints and that the variational principles that we have from physics are just being kind of um, decorated. And I don't think any of us believe that. And I think Chris had that nice spectrum where he said, yeah, there might be phenomena for which that's true, but many that we care about aren't. They're actually emergent regularities that have their own law-like behavior, and that was something that Murray went to great lengths to argue, and I think was quite right. And these theories of contingent generality, emergent laws. And um, these are obviously the outcome of some Darwinian drift-like process, uh, but that, that hasn't really been worked out how these constraints get locked in and then how they then interact with these um, symmetries and conserve properties to produce the regularities that everyone discussed. That's, and I think Jen encapsulated that in her little triumvirate. It's open. Um, the question that we often discussed at SFI is do we need new mathematics? And what that became was agent-based modeling, and machine learning. So it wasn't so much new mathematics, it was new computational technologies that allowed us to short-circuit understanding in a certain way. Um, and maybe that is the future, sort of long lines of computer code, um, and, and I think we have to take that very seriously. Um, so, and Van sort of made, I think, a really interesting point 
um, that Google would find a heresy, which was, even though they do this, which is, let's use some of the insights of universality to find the appropriate dimensions or bases on which classifiers will work efficiently. And they do that all the time, um, but they don't like that. They want everything to be discovered in the data. And, but I do think it's a really interesting path forward that maybe the ultimate value of this very esoteric pursuit is in the most pragmatic domain, which is in classifiers. And so I thought that was really quite an interesting point. So anyway, the general remarks, I just open it up for conversation. I do think, just to remind everyone, next May we have another event in Santa Fe really commemorating more explicitly the contributions of Murray um, on contingency and universality, where we will be revisiting these, con these topics, but, but also focusing on some of Murray's contributions to physics, and that's supported by the National Science Foundation. I think it's a very interesting meeting. And I think we should consider this as the start of actually of a program, and I'm not saying necessarily that NSF should support this program. It would be very nice if you thought about it. But it seems to me we should be actually cataloging some of these universalities that we've um, been identifying and really binding them to common theory in a very systematic way. And uh, if SFI doesn't do it, no one else will. So with that, uh, if anyone else wants to make general remarks of any kind, it would be fantastic. Thank you. I just have a general question for everyone, or I guess the panel this morning especially. <coughs> I'm wondering if we look at these universal scaling laws and we at some point managed to uncover the mechanisms that actually produce all of these, and they're all different. There are different things that do it for forests, and there are different things that do it for organisms, and there are different things for blood vessels, and different things, right? And they point to completely different consequences for the systems that they are part of. For, for example, if you want to understand whether there's something that has to do with the robustness of the system, or something like that. Would we then still call them universal? What, what would be universal there? So if, if multiple mechanisms can produce the exact same, so it, it would be still amazing that we always converge on the same thing. I, I, I find that. But what is the uni is, is there still universality? I mean, one way to think about it is that is that at all possible? Because you said many different mechanisms and many different consequences. And I actually, what my experience is, is that the mechanisms are rarely different. They may seem different to the practitioner, but when you break it down to the, to the, to the kind of like the mathematical level, if you see log normal, it's typically a multiplicative process. If you see a power law, it's a rich gets richer phenomena or an optimization process is generating it and so on. So, and, and this becomes often a semantic is that people say, well, I have a different mechanism in the brain and I have a different in the tree. But when you actually break it down to the components, the mathematical components, they aren't that different. Now, the consequences, of course, will be very different, and that's expected so because they're in different systems. And therefore, there are different aspects of the systems that we care about that, that don't need to be universal. In some cases, you care about health. The other one, you care about the multiplicity of the organisms, robustness, and so on. So I, I would think that at the end of the road, and there's lots of indications for that, we will find that the mechanisms are universal, and we, when we disagree on that, it will be probably a semantic, in the sense that there, there will not be a hundred different mechanisms to generate this type of observed behavior in the system, and, but the consequences will be diverse because the applications are very diverse. At least that's one might think. Yeah, but I, I mean, just to give a specific example, I also work on pattern formation at the ecosystem scale, and there you can find multiple distinctly, mathematically distinct mechanisms for getting um, hexagonal patterns. They're very common. You can do the Turing type thing that gives you vegetation patterns that are hexagonal, but you can also have other things like, that are discrete interactions between animals and so on. And so there you can get the exact same pattern, very different, mm, mathematically different mechanisms. Um, and completely different consequences if you want to look at them and infer something about the health of the ecosystem, for example. So, so there, I mean, hexagonal pattern is universal. There are many, many things that converge to that, but in principle, we, we don't really learn very much from saying that we've seen hexagonal pattern if we have 
a multitude of, of mechanisms. I mean, I guess that's where I, I wanted, that's how I wanted to phrase the question. So I guess uh, I, the only thing I would add to it is that is there a chance that maybe that's not the right way to put the question? That, that the hexagonal patterns is not the question and there's a deeper right. one there. Yeah, so that's what you were referring to. Exactly. But I, I don't want to monopolize. There is a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I <coughs> just want to elaborate on what Laszlo said because I basically agree with pretty much everything you said. But um, <coughs> so in what I was trying to do, um, it's a good example of that because um, I would say uh, that the underlying principles are the same, for example, between plants and animals. They're those, I try to write those down, and they, tra as I said, transcend the evolved design. But actually, when you carry, of course, we didn't show any of the mathematics, it's completely, no, not completely, it's very different, very different for mammals than it is for plants. It's a completely different calculation. But the starting point is the same, and I don't want to make it sound so grandiose, but it's sort of like in physics, of course, you know, you have conservation of energy. But, you know, if you work on a problem at, in quantum mechanics or you work on a problem about, you know, billiard balls colliding, it's, uh, you know, the, the equations right down are quite different. But the concept is the same, and so it is with, uh, with these. That was the idea. And um, I think in the end, I also agree with what Laszlo said, it's a bit of a semantic problem in the end. I mean, I... I would like to think that, you know, universal sort of has implied in it something what the word means, that it somehow has very broad application, um, uniting things that are superficially very different. I mean, that's sort of the concept, I guess. Um, but um, scaling law, a sc you could narrow that concept to just say a scaling law represents a universal phenomenon. I mean, that is, it's connecting all these different things. So it's a little bit semantic. And in physics, of course, we have this concept um, of universality, which has a much more technical meaning, right? I mean, to, to, that came out of, well, probably predated, of course, but got formalized in the renormalization group of universality classes and so on, which is, which is something that I think is extremely, that somehow hasn't entered other fields, which I think might be very interesting. That is, the idea being that um, um, the, for certain things that you want to calculate, um, it, the, the, the details of the theory don't matter, so to speak, and if you, you just choose the simplest one, and if you can calculate in that, that will give you the right answer for this in this very specific domain, <coughs> and that is, uh, so the universality there, meaning that there is a very large class of uh, um, um, apparently different theories, models, um, but um, they are destined necessarily to give the same answer for, well, in the original case, of course, phase transitions. So I actually just wanted to build on something that Laszlo said, which is um, that, oh, for a power law, maybe there are sort of two or three different mechanisms that we tend to see that, that give power laws. And if you go back even further and you just think, oh, what happens when I see a normal distribution, right? This goes back to Gauss, um, right? There are lots of different ways to get a normal distribution. The normal distribution we think of as universal, but also there are sort of a few very common paths that lead to a normal distribution. And so you could imagine that something like a scaling law like a power law or something, is sort of a, a numerical sign of universality. And maybe there are, you know, half a dozen different ways to get that. Each of those is sort of its own f slightly finer grained distinction, but still a, a somewhat universal, you know, if, if there are really only sort of half a dozen ways that we see in nature that produce power laws, right? It's not necessarily that the power law itself is the universal phenomena. It's a sign of, you know, one of these six things or however many there are. And so I, I guess you can have sort of multiple different levels of universality and and there's some point at which you say, oh, well, you know, there are thousands of different ways this could occur. Well, okay, maybe those are no longer universal, right? But when there's only, only a small number that we see, it seems like more likely to be universal. Uh, so 
and build on this discussion, in particular Jeffrey's remark about the absence of the discussion of renormalization, that's not entirely true because coarse graining has come up in a number of our talks, and that's of course connected to renormalization. Yeah, and so and I'll just push on that a little bit. So um, coarse, coarse graining, of course, by us as scientists, and then also as I stress in my work, and I tried to stress a little bit in my talk yesterday, coarse, by, coarse graining by nature. So how nature is coming up with its own effective theories and, and, and doing the coarse graining is an important issue. And there are sort of three, uh, three points I want to stress as a result of that coarse graining. One is, build, um, comes back to a remark that, um, or a question that Mercedes asked yesterday, which is what sets the time scale in the system? And I answered by, um, saying these signals and summary statistics and so forth. And what I really should have said is that the coarse graining sets the time scales, actually. The coarse graining by the components gives rise, in at least the systems that I've worked on, to time scales and slow variables. Um, and then uh, along the same lines, the coarse graining is also a means for overcoming the subjectivity through the sort of idiosyncratic information processing I was discussing. And that, I would suggest, in information processing systems can lead to universality. So there's a path through from renormalization through coarse graining to universality and in information processing systems, I think, that we need to explore further. Do I have the floor? Yes, this is apropos of the, the question of cause. And uh, here I want to hearken back to the, the physics precedent because it's the simplest one. What you find at the primitive levels of science is that finding systematic behavior, universal behavior is just the beginning. It's the symptom of something happening. You're not done until you figure out what that is. Okay? So, so it, it's organized, the system is organizing itself, it's doing something, and this is a symptom you've discovered. So you, what you know is it's doing something, but you're not, you haven't advanced from mysticism to science until you've figured out what that is. Now, in the original uh, Ken Wilson versions of this effect, we now know what that is. Okay? The strongest scaling in physics comes from two things. It comes from matter self-organizing itself into states of matter, like the metallic state, the insulating state, and the vacuum space. Okay? These, are, these are what we call in the parlance stable fixed points, but actually they're, they're physical phenomena. And when they happen, a whole bunch of redundancy begins to occur, and that is captured in the scaling laws. The other is at continuous phase transitions. There is a very similar thing happening. That they, um, but now, the scaling doesn't happen because of the renormalization group. The scaling happens because of something physical that occurred, and the renormalization group is the mathematics that captures it. So similarly, in life, or in a city, or in a, or in a big engineering organization, if you find a uh, regular behavior like this, similar thought process occurs that it's symptomatic of something that's not obvious that's happening. And so discovering it is kind of the beginning. Then you have to dig down and figure out what the hell is going on to make this happen, because it's highly non-obvious. You say it's universal. Um, uh, indeed, it may be universal, but it has a cause. And the really important question is getting down to that cause and understanding it. I just have a quick comment, um, but first I would like to say thanks to everybody for uh, an intense and really creative series of talks. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed all of this. I think one thing that I would like to just throw out there is that you know, given the, what we've now heard and learned um, from everything from the design of brains to collective behavior to the workings of, of physiology and, and ecosystems, if we were to discover life on another planet, you know, if we were to do um, the Gouldian example of replaying life on Earth, we wiped everything out and let it kind of all come back, what would actually be conserved you know, throughout? Would anything be, be similar to what we see today? Um, I, I think it would be a really good challenge for everybody in the room here to go through what we've learned about brains, collective behavior, economies, um, and identify what would be what would be the same you know, if we were to come back and discover something new outside of our own planet. You know, what would be conserved? Could we could we actually do that? You know, um, I think it would be a useful, constructive exercise.
yeah. Are you expecting an answer, Brian? Well, no, not everybody at once. <laughs> not everyone at once, please. Yeah. Right. I will take it as a, uh, <laughs> to do it at home. Um, no, I, I just wanted to f follow up on that because I think uh, perhaps in, in those classes of uh, systems that live in the middle of your diagram, Chris, uh, I think this, this scale, uh, this slow time scale of the system, at least for some of these systems where we are looking at construction, but in terms of ecological interactions and then adaptation, I think it's, it is probably given by the speed at which you can accumulate innovation. And that's deeply connected with everything else in, in the system. And I like to think a little, I mean, I was left in, in some of what we saw this morning, some what of Pablo said and so on, some uh, you know, connections there that, that we haven't pursued far enough. Uh, far enough about what determines that scale. And I think that is very connected to, to knowing something about how the systems collapse because they will be losing uh, somehow what sets that time scale naturally in the system and, and going to really just a, a drift of, of that in which there is nothing set in that time scale or perhaps it's just you know, too fast. And, and, and it's not even happening. I mean, there is no, no accumulation. So I think there's something really interesting about that time scale and, 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 and this point of, of uh, uh, anyhow, collapse in, in not being able to accumulate innovation. Um, so this is a slightly different topic. I'm not answering Brian, sorry. Uh, but what, uh, maybe it's answering Brian, but, but one thing that struck me uh, is in, in a workshop about universality, how little we talked about universal computation, that, that notion, even though we've been talking quite a bit about computation and information processing. And in the early days of SFI when I was there, uh, this was a really big, important thing that people were talking about. You know, Chris Moore was talking about proving that dynamical systems were universal in computation. Maybe Stephen Wolfram isn't here, but you know, that was like his, his main principle of the universe is that everything is universal. And I'm just wondering, it, it has the concept of universal computation as a more general concept in science, is it still relevant? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's been done. And why not? <laughs> because it's wrong. How so? Bob wants to make, Bob wants to Sorry, can I? Sorry, I don't have the floor. Let's Bob and, Bob and oh, Bob, Bob first. Yeah, okay. yeah here we go. Yeah. The, um, the, a, a computation is a, is a, has to do, again, with engineering, a thing you do. Computation is something you do, okay? It's something you do, and it produces an output that is, that is useful. Can you speak louder? Yes, it's, computation is a thing that an organism does, or something does, and it produces an output that has use. And what Stephen did is he mixed up that with natural physical phenomena. The difference is that when something happens in nature, there's no economics. Okay? There's, no, there's no user relationship. There's no, there's no uh, value proposition. It simply happens. And uh, so that's, that's the answer I give you. The thing that's wrong is th that's the thing he got wrong. He didn't understand that those two things are fundamentally different. I totally disagree. Yeah. <laughs> so can, good, good. can I? I'm Josh. Josh yeah, today. so... Oh, yeah. maybe. Does Melanie so want to respond to... Josh. Okay, go ahead. Or, uh, okay, all right. So, yeah, all right. So, so I would say that at least at the moment, um, universal computation seems a lot less relevant, and I think there are sort of two reasons for that. One is this question that I think there were even some, there was a workshop on recently of like, what does it mean for a biological system to compute? Or any system, I think the workshop was on biology, but you could ask for any system, you know, if it's not a computer, where we sort of know that it's computing, what does it mean for a system to be computing something? And when does it count as computation versus just dynamics, right? Um, the other thing is that Turing universality 
is too easy to achieve. Almost everything has it. It's like it's hard to come up with a system that's not just like a plain linear system or exponential growth, you know, unbounded exponential growth or whatever. It's it's actually hard to come up with an interesting system that's not Turing universal, right? And this gets back to like you were mentioning the work of Chris Moore and and a lot of other people. But it's just I think it's too easy to achieve Turing universality, and it's almost like that. It, I mean, you know, I don't like giving definitions of complexity in this context, but but that might be almost like a minimum bar is like, well, if it's not Turing universal, it's probably too simple to be complex, right? But sort of everything that we've talked about in the past two days, I, I'm sure is Turing universal, right? It's just too easy. And so it's not, it's not a distinguishing feature among complex systems, except maybe to distinguish complex from simple, right? It's, and, and it's, it's so common that, again, it's sort of too universal, right? It's like saying everything is made of matter. Well, okay, we all know that, but that doesn't help us understand these complex systems, right? So I think a combination of those two things okay, are... That, yeah. Can I... I'll respond first to Bob and then to Josh. Um, I, I think that in... I mean, computation in that organisms do does have, in some sense, a, an economic value because it feeds back to their fitness, right? Which, so there's no like outside interpreter interpreting the result of computation, but there is the system, the system in its environment. So that, I, I think computation, it, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying Wolfram got wrong, and maybe you can clarify, but, but just one sec, I, I do think that it is relevant ecologically but let me just reply to Josh real quickly to start another argument. But okay, universal computation is too easy to achieve. But couldn't you say the same thing for you know we saw like a million power laws on Jeffrey's slides? Couldn't you say power laws are also too easy to achieve, so they're not relevant? <laughs> Don't, not distinguishing. But then it gets back to the question: What's the underlying mechanism, yeah. right? Which is kind of what we were. Yeah, right. Yeah. And these are many. So the power laws. Right. I mean, right. If there so I agree with Melanie. So the fitness concept is a kind of you know, optimization economic concern, and you can even make it more generic by thinking of it in terms of mutual information, the fit to the in between the organism and the environment. So I think that's not the problem with the Wolfram thing. Josh, I mean, the, the idea that um, you know, Turing is everywhere is, is, is problematic because behavior is finite. And so there might, the underlying generative model for nature might be Turing, but showing that it is is actually really hard. So that's one practical challenge that we face. And you see that in evolution of, in the language discussions a lot. It comes up like actually showing that a language is context free or something is really hard. Um, another point is that there are other potentially other forms of computation that need not be Turing. And I mean, this is sort of the point of universal Chomsky hierarchy, you know, version of exactly. So like Walter and, um, and uh, Leo Buss and then um, what's the other one? Luca, right, David? Luca Cavalli? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Luca Cavalli. I mean, they tried to de develop a formal language for chemical systems, chemi chemical based on um, molecular dynamics that took seriously mechanism. And, um, and so, that was, you know, that's their alchemy slash pi calculus stuff. And, uh, and that's, so it's like an alternative in some sense to Turing that takes more seriously the biology or the mechanism. And I, I would argue, as I said a little bit in, in my talk yesterday, that we really can't do that for biology yet. I mean, you can do, sort of do it for chemical systems and molecular systems because the, we have a taxonomy of how things work that's really rigorous, but we don't have that for the rest of adaptive systems. So to go to try and develop a formal language before we know how these systems work seems to me premature. So I think we can talk about computation. It need not necessarily be Turing. In the end, it might come back to that. I don't know. But there's, that shouldn't be the only um, kind of computation we have on the table. I, I, uh, yes, I, I do want to. I do want to. Okay, John. I think Van's been waiting even longer, actually, because I can see them both. <laughs> I'm going to change the topic somewhat, mm -hmm. but we will go back. But, but let's go back to the earlier parts, where first in relation to um, Karina's question, it came with the idea that maybe universality is semantic, and I don't think it's actually semantic. I think it's that if we think that it's universal at any level of abstraction, we call it universal. Even if other levels of abstraction, it's not. And so I think semantic is not the same thing as 
context dependent based on level of abstraction. I think we call it universal if it's any level of abstraction it's common, which is usually math. It's usually some mathematical form. Then for Brian's question, I think the closest we can come to answering that and putting on my physicist hat and Jeffrey is thinking about um, you know, solar systems and galaxies, to what extent they look the same or different if we look across them. And con the conservation of energy, right, or conservation of mass, they have to all follow rules of gravity, laws of gravitation. We look at them and they look different visually. Some form black holes, some form white dwarfs for a solar system star. Um, and so if we just happenly, randomly came upon another planet by happenstance, I wouldn't expect it to look like ours. But if we had a billion of them, I would expect certain categories of them, and that we could categorize them in some way, and that they would follow the laws of evolution and information processing in a way that we could understand and, and deal with. That's all. Uh, John and, and then Bob. Okay, my turn. I am talking. Don't start talking, please, while I am talking. I am talking here. I want to uh, start a new thread on universality and uh, pull, it, pull the machine learning in again. Uh, and I want to bounce off. Uh, what David raised about the uni universality of the, the, the or the formal equivalence behind uh, natural selection and Bayesian uh, uh, framework and learning, including specifically machine learning. When we have universality, it opens the op opportunity for productive cross fertilization, the classic SFI move. And let's try to do it here. When these, when these. Uh, when we see that, that formal equivalence between these different processes, uh, we can address, the, uh, among other things, the topic of the black box nature of machine learning. I think what concerns a lot of people about it, at least, at least for myself, I don't have any problem with machine learning being a black box in the way it works. When it works, it's happy. We get our result. Everybody's good. What concerns us about the black box nature of machine learning is its modes of failure. It fails unpre unpredictably and sometimes catastrophically, and uh, that, that, that part of the black box is a problem. So if we want to understand modes of failure, this formal equivalence between these systems can be very, very informative. For example, in the field of evolutionary medicine, we focus a lot on how natural selection fails uh, after a uh, history of forever of optimization in life, including all animals and humans. Everything, everything about humans was designed, if you will, by optimizing natural selection. So why are there so many things wrong? Why has natural selection left human bodies so frail, so vulnerable to disease? That's one of the central questions that in the application of evolutionary theory to medicine. And there's actually a good bit of of uh, applied theory there. What are the modes of failure in natural selection? What are the sources of non-optimality in, in the human body? We've got a, a short list of about six or seven that are well recognized, well uh, thoroughly discussed, and I'm wondering about how well we can generalize those. I won't go through the list now, but it's easy to, to look, it's easy to look up. And so that was the only connection I wanted to note. I'm done, thanks. Okay, so there are two things on the table. One, one is computation and the other is machine learning <coughs> and what they mean. Now, let me deal with both and then I'll get off, off the air. One, the point I was trying to make by yelling is that, <laughs> is that computation has some, uh, has the word, has some implications in it. And um, uh, the thing that you said which I, I love because it's I think it's right is that is that uh, the uh, computation that living things do are purposeful, okay, and there and the metric is survival and uh, and and reproduction and so forth, just like computation is for us. So computation is an economic thing for living things I'm pretty sure, and uh, and for us, uh, for a water drop. It isn't. Okay, that that was the distinction. So the competitions that we're most interested in are the are the first kind, which have to do with use, and what they do. They're defined by what what their use is. Now, keeping that thought, machine learning. Let me make a mumble about that from a math point of view. 
Machine learning is conceptually trivial. It is a um, filter. Let's say you've got some inputs, you've got some outputs, and you train it okay, by giving it patterns. If you had a perfect one and you trained it forever, it would, get, it would exactly find uh, the, the pattern by definition because it would, it was, it would, identify, would survey every single possible combinatorial input and assign to it a combina an output. And that is the universal, the universal decoding matrix. Okay? This is something they teach you the first week in computer science how to do this. The neural network is different from that in that the size of the switching network and the training set are way less than are, than are enough to get it exactly right by definition. You're, you're not surveying every possible input. You're only surveying some of them. And you're uh, uh, coding it through an intermediate layer that is finite. So what that is in effect doing is making a theory of the inputs based of, of what the situation is based on inadequate data. If you give the neural network a data set for which that works, then it works. Okay? If, on the other hand, you give it a different problem, one that's way too hard for it, it'll just give you some random wrong answer. So I absolutely concur with you that... Um, that uh, treating machine learning as a mystical new technology is BS, okay? It is actually a specific technology for a specific class of problem. And for those kinds of problem, it might be terrific, but it's very easy to cook up a problem for which it fails. And so the, the skeleton in the closet with machine learning is what is it about the problem you're asking this machine to do that makes it possible for the machine to do it? Just jump in a, a little on this computing thing, which is a very pragmatic answer. Um, so, firstly, and it, you've said it, both of you have said it, there's this notion that's introduced in complex systems which is not present in physics, and it's the, and John has sort of alluded to it too, which is the notion of correctness. That is, there can be mistakes. There are no mistakes in physics. Right? And compute... Well, yeah, there might be physicists who are mistakes, Bob. <laughs> That's a different issue. Um, no, so then, so, and that was a nice thing that theory of computation introduced, right, which is in how do I get to the right answer in some reasonable amount of time. So that's the second point. Big unanswered question, and Stuart, for all of his obfuscations, um, oops, this is being filmed, um, <laughs> one of the questions he asked which seemed reasonable was, you know, how much time does it take to create things like this? And we don't really have a theory that gives us an answer to that. So that's interesting. So the, the notion of complexity in computer science as being time complexity is interesting, it seems. And the other one, which we, hasn't come up much, is, which is not present in physics, uh, is the algorithm. So there are, again, and David Marr made this point beautifully in his book Vision, right? There are functions. Physics has that. You have you know, action principles. There are mechanisms, which is what Bob was saying we look for once we've found them. But in the middle um, is how they connect. And in computers, you have this whole area, which is neither the hardware nor the outcome, the sorting, which is the algorithm. And we have those. And I've always thought that that middle layer, um, maybe by analogy or even deeper, is where computer science can be useful in thinking algorithmically. And that's not about Turing. It's got nothing to do with Turing, actually. So just my two cents. Yeah, so <clears throat> if I can say something, I, I guess we are uh, very close to finishing. Um, OK, one thing about the computing. Uh, Stephen Wolfram's biggest scene was not <coughs> computation in biology. He wrote in 1985 a PRL letter, a uh, PRL paper, in which, he, uh, which was called Undecidability and Intractability in Physics. He claimed that all of the physics is computational. This was his biggest scene, and that went in his book after that, The New Kind of Science, where it takes, I think, 80 pages to derive f equals m times a. Uh, you could do it, but uh, the question is, is it useful? Um, 
I just wanted to say something. I've been listening, and it seems that like every workshop that we try to run on like interdisciplinary topic ends up with this kind of discussion where everybody says what they want to say and uh, not rather have some more focused discussion of where are we going in the future. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to hear and uh, cl clarify for me and for my colleagues at NSF uh, is, um, is there some kind of a, okay, so to give you an example, several examples, one of them was the renormalization group. That changed our understanding of huge number, uh, amount of uh, physical phenomena from high energy, low energy physics, um, and so forth. Um, it, it got applied to biology and to complex systems. Um, Similar thing happened with in, in solid state physics when Landau introduced quasi particles out of metals start looking the same. And it was clear why it's happening when he described it. Um, Bob's example with the fractional quantum Hall effect also is a typical thing where open the huge uh, uh, doors for uh, new, new, new physics and new, new science. So the question is, do we see here something that um, are we on the verge of understanding something, uni call it universal the way you want to say it, uh, that actually can open the doors of really um, large developments with a lot of uh, activities and open new ideas and new frontiers? Um, in some sense, um, so network science, I, 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 I don't like calling it network science. I don't think there is network science. It's called networks. Uh, mathematicians have been working on networks for hundreds of years, actually. But actually, uh, when Stephen and Laszlo um, uh, 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 wrote their papers, uh, it opened a huge frontier for a lot of sciences. Uh, and that was, I think, uh, kind of a revolution in 20 years ago. So is there something in complex systems that we see that is happening right now that, that could be, uh, have the same impact? Yeah. Anyway, so this is what I want. I'm not really the person to make this remark because this isn't my skill set. It's something that comes up in my work, as Josh pointed out yesterday, but Josh was the one who hit on it, and that's the intersection between the probabilistic thinking, information theory, and the more, the more traditionally deterministic computational thinking. Hybridizing that in some way that's rigorous and elegant is what I think we need for um, this energy information uh, intersection in adaptive systems. I think it's an unfair question. I mean, because it's so, it's been in ev evidence for two days. I mean, you could say the whole scaling framework had huge, opened up tons of doors, like gazillions of people working on it. Social scientists, urban planners, molecular biologists, the MaxEnt framework, everyone's using it. So I think that the use of InfoMax principles in neural systems, which you know that Bill worked on and many of our community work on, I think. I mean, arguably bigger than some of the physics is certainly bigger than anything Stephen Wolfram ever did, uh, which I find, to be honest, almost uniformly useless um, and a kind of based on what anthropologists call a doctrine of signatures. If it looks like it, it is it, which is about as far as he got in science. So I think it wouldn't be difficult to list, from the point of view of open doors, fields that have done just that, theoretical immunology, on and on and on. I think now... It's a more ambitious question, which is, you know, for this meeting, not areas that have been cited and led to new science, but actually, um, are there emergent principles of order in living systems that, we, that all of this beautiful work is pointing to? And, and what are the best tools and ways of getting to, to an understanding? I, th I, think it's, I think it's more than an influence in science, which I think has been overwhelming, empirically, demonstrably. You mean this sort of work? Or the well, I mean, 30 years is not a long time. 30 years ago, in Florida, in the conferences, in the complex systems, we had very similar things. Really? I'd be curious. I mean, no, I because scaling at that yeah. time was a big thing because of the renormalization group theory, because of John Hopfield's model, because of spin glasses. <laughs> Interesting argument. I mean, I know where these papers appeared, <laughs> and so, and when. I think that, um, as you know, uh, the... I mean, I suffice sort of abandoned the sort of obsession with spin glasses 20 years ago. Um, yeah, but, but so, I mean, but, but the same complexity questions were arising at that time that are arising now. Actually, actually, I agree with you. I think that this uh, kind of 
I don't want to call it new theory because again, it's, uh, uh, but this kind of uh, synthesis might actually bring some new, uh, very, very fruitful ideas to describe uh, complex systems. That's required to do what David is suggesting. That's what I would say. Like, do you, to make an advance over your meeting so many years ago, we have to do this. And another way to describe it, and it was in Josh's plot, was is like the way I usually think about it, but I think it's too narrow, is statistical mechanics plus computer science plus some cognition. Um, but I like the probabilistic slash computational framework. I think it's more generic. Um, so the other thing is, uh, and this gets back to what I think David was saying earlier about the history of SFI and also just sort of the history of the field, is, yeah, it was the same conversation 30 years ago, except now, as we've seen for the past two days, instead of bloviating in the air about toy models and seeing all these things, we actually see them in real systems, right? And we have the data and we've started applying the theory to the systems to actually analyze them. And that strikes me as a huge difference. And um, just to echo what Jess said, you know, now that we have that, you can start to think, which hopefully we've all been doing the last couple of days, okay, now we see this in all the real systems and we know, okay, some of, maybe some of the things people were talking about 30 years ago didn't pan out and some of them did. And then the question is, what are the, the universal universals, right? Is the, yeah, and the kind of synthesis that Jess was talking about. From the, but from the point of view of funding, that means that there are individual programs that address these different systems. And if you're e ecologist, then you go to ecology program at NSF. If you're a physicist, you come to me. And if you're in a, doing mathematics, then you go to mathematics. And that means that we don't need to have any special universal program that actually addresses all these questions. This is exactly what uh, you're saying. So yes and no. Um, I, I mean, I see your point, but I think, and people can correct me if I'm wrong here, that all of us who have worked on universality, we basically do it behind closed doors, right? You write a grant to your division about sort of a more standard thing in your field because you know who's going to be reviewing it and it's you know not the people in this room, right? And the people in this room have been very successful at getting those grants, but it's a standard grant, and you have to sort of work on the universality almost as a side project. Or, or it's just, oh, it's just a method, but, you know, I'm actually trying to answer the questions of your field. I right. Jeffy West. Well, I Jeffy West. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I'm actually embarrassed that uh, I had a slide up, which I forgot <coughs> to show, giving my thanks to you, uh, <laughs> because I'm afraid you'll cut me, well, you probably will cut me off anyway. Can I speak now? Is that okay? Yeah, so um, I, um, you know, I think I, I mean, I agree with the pushback on Creston that people have brought up, but I think more than anything else, <coughs> um, you know, the, um, the whole culture of complexity is one and, and, and associated with it is kind of transdisciplinarity and, and so on, all the usual buzzwords. I think um, that more and more is clearly becoming, it's a bit platitudinous, but it's becoming more and more important. And um, two points I want to make on that. One is the polemic, my little editorial polemic about the fact that there is no program at the National Science Foundation dealing with at explicitly dealing with urbanization and cities and their, and their driving force of the lemmings, as Bob <laughs> put it, of, of uh, sustainability question, which is extraordinary. I mean, it's truly extraordinary because it is an existential threat. And um, it, it's, I consider the NSF violating its um, uh, charter to Congress, frankly, by not addressing it. That's my editorial comment. Did now, second, no, well, <laughs> come back to that. Uh, but the second thing is the point that you brought up, um, Creston, you know, we can apply to the mathematics division, the physics division, the evolutionary biology, and so on and so forth. But you know, when SFI was founded, and it was funded originally by the NSF, we have here one of the original program officers, from when we used to have an umbrella grant. Um, and it was fantastic. And uh, we tried to integrate all this stuff. And I, I don't know that we did a great job of integrating it because it was still relatively early days. And then that, um, despite the support of uh, Mike and uh, Jack Lightbody, 
uh, who were terrific in helping us, um, that was no longer viable. So it was kind of ironic at the very time NSF started talking about crossing the boundaries, breaking down the boundaries, I sat on the, the advisory committee here and the director came in and said, the major thrust of the National Science Foundation is now transdisciplinary, I think he said cross-disciplinary studies. That's what he said. Um, at that very time, they said we can no longer fund this umbrella grant. It had to be broken down, which is... So it was kind of weird. So um, I think in now, actually, a much stronger case, much stronger than 20 years ago, uh, it could be made that uh, such a grant uh, should be funded by the NSF. The NSF should, in a certain sense, put money where its mouth is in terms of promoting things that cross boundaries, that are very gray, that are, in that sense, a little bit more risky, and one of the great things that this kind of thinking has brought is it is fighting against um, the deconstruction of science into lots of diddly little questions, each one of which is important, but this, the whole is much greater than the sum of its parts, of course. And it brings up some of the big questions which have come up in the last 36 hours. I think it's been one of the things that's been enjoyable that every once in a while one of the big questions comes up. I've only been disappointed that we haven't got down to discussing the meaning of life, which is what I'd like to find out before I conk out soon. What? <laughs> Wouldn't it be good? So maybe that should be included in this. But anyway, but more seriously, I do think that the, the, the time is very ripe for um, uh, recognizing the, uh, the role of complexity science as a highly significant major area that transcends the ones that uh, currently exist. And that probably requires, if it's to be done seriously, would require um, some restructuring, actually. And that's the problem with the urbanization, going back to that, the urbanization and city stuff. It cru it, it's bits everywhere because everything occurs in, of course, in, in urbanization and cities. Everything from, you know, physics to economics and social science and so on. I also but want to defend, because again, just because it's so young, if you look at the history of statistical mechanics, thermodynamics in particular, how long it took. And, you know, people discussed these topics for a long time until they did good phenomenology. And I think that it's quite interesting. I mean, SFI, there was no internet, <laughs> right? There were no large databases. There's no way of even storing that kind of data. A lot's converged. And um, so one thing is just that. I think we've been in a phenomenology phase, of, and that's what you heard a lot of, and I think that's actually critically important and very undervalued by the early founders of SFI. Um, the other side, though, I think, which is just remarkable to me, and I, I don't know if you feel this, I do feel this strongly, is here we're in a room with ecologists, neuroscientists, physicists, and other kinds of people, and we're all speaking a common language. And that's kind of remarkable, and that there are similar processes underlying all of these diverse systems we're describing. That probably wouldn't be found typically in proposals submitted to independent divisions. So I think that level of cohesion combined with this very earnest phenomenology is, 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 is important uh, and not to be undervalued, I think. So, I was not saying it as a piece, it was just uh, challenging. Yeah, so, so if I can follow up, because that's very connected to what Josh said, and, and, and I feel like compared to, well, I don't know how many decades ago, at least even within my field, uh, what I heard about today is remarkably different than what you would have heard about five years ago, ten years ago, and there is a commonality, and the, the funny thing is if you try to go to ecology, I couldn't even begin to go somewhere that would think to support the kinds of bridges that I have to bring even within different kinds of ecological systems. In fact, I happen to, <laughs> to, to have to do some of this work of ideas on the side of the sort of work that I, that I have funded. And I think that the, the, the risk, because why do I come to these kinds of meetings or why do I go to SFI, 
is because of these conversations which I find, you know, I leave these places with a level of ideas and potential collaborations that I cannot find through other exercises. So the problem is that we are left a bit in our silos recreating the wheel and perhaps not having the best, uh, how can I say, uh, we may have ideas, we may have knowledge about the field, we may have interesting phenomenological uh, aspects, but I think we need to partner with people that may have from the more analytical to, and I think doing that is very difficult. We do it in this kind of uh, super linear, uh, strange encounter rates uh, that is not supported in any way. And, and that kind of diversity exists within disciplines, it exists across disciplines, and I don't think there is a mechanism to fund it. If I said I want to uh, work with, uh, I don't know, with uh, Pablo to think across from uh, infectious diseases to, to I don't know, what uh, trees or whatever. I mean, even within ecology, what would, how would you do this? And even less if I need uh, to then sort of uh, uh, work across with physics. And what, what uh, we heard, uh, <laughs> Jessica said about uh, these connections with information and so on, I think we could make much, much faster progress. This is not about one set of tools. It's about putting these aspects together. I think if we had the incentive to come to the table and do this, it will happen a lot faster and not with this kind of maybe spinning the wheel until... Uh, so I think that's where it will be super super good to have, and you can say, well, we have rules of life, but this is not the kind of thing that, uh, that is promoted either. Can I just add one thing to that? So, I mean, even in this room, that's supposedly so cutting edge, and this is, you know, no, no disrespect to people who are focused on energy, the overwhelming emphasis has been on energy. Information didn't come up, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm biased, admittedly, because I work on it, nearly as much as, as, it, as, as it needs to. And so, that's the signal of something interesting. It's something we should be pushing more on. Um, this is just my two cents. There's some very interesting development in um, information geometry, and I know that you guys are somehow uh, leading that uh, with uh, Anihad, IA, and some other people. And th there is a recent paper by you that uh, it might be interesting to consider because it touches on something very fundamental, which is how we define the units we want to understand. And there are a lot of hidden assumptions. We start doing theory with things that we assume are given, but we don't take care much of defining which would be the units. And you, the paper on individuality is, is I think, is fundamental to actually uh, take the, the blinds off and try to do something different and not just five species. Well, we what are the state variables, we'll say, John? What are the right ones? I mean, is biomass or number of species? So. It's been a major urban investment. Yeah. Yeah. It's even better now. <laughs> Hopefully it's better. I don't know about bigger. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, this is an like interesting little termination. Um, I just want to thank everybody, actually. I, Kirsten, obviously, NSF. I hate to remind you, you did fund this meeting. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> that's a good point. Damn. Wait a minute. Oh, well, that's a detail that matters. <laughs> and so, anyway, we really appreciate it. And I particularly appreciate all of I personally, SFI, really appreciate all of you. I think I feel extraordinarily privileged to be living in this community at this time. Uh, these are really deep ideas. So anyway, thank you very much, and see you all soon. And thank you very much for having us, Sarah. Yes. <laughs>